Hi, everybody. Welcome to the episode of In the School Parking Lot. My name is Paul Everett, so I'm your host. You can reach me at my email address, and I wish you would. It's B-A-N-D in the number two, together, band, together at Comcast.net. Also, visit our handsome website, which is ConductingMyLife.com, and all, of course, all the information is in the description of today and every episode of In the School Parking Lot. So who am I? A brief introduction, as always. I'm Paul Everts. I've been teaching high school music and now, fourth through twelfth grade music since 1989. Yeah, since the 20th century. Uh, around August, oh no, no, excuse me, around April the 8th, 2020, 2021, slow down, uh, the principal told me, Paul, you need to keep Jesus Christ in the parking lot. And I said to the principal, did you tell all the uh, gay teachers and students to take down their pride flags in the classroom? Oh, no, that's different. That's different. Did you tell all the BLM supporters? Because that was the rage, you know, back four, three years ago, BLM was everywhere. Did you tell them to take down their banners? No, that's different, Paul. Oh, so all those people can have their expression of who they are. But me having a Bible, me saying, thank God, gets me in trouble. And I have all the paperwork to show that, yes, even saying God is good to me is yeah and so i thought well parking lot jesus i guess that's where we need to go and you know there's always these little chats after board meetings school meetings in the parking lot so that's where we get this from in um october the 15th i retired the october 15th 2021 i retired from public education because i didn't want to be culpable anymore i didn't want to call it i didn't want to call students by their um new names let's put it that way uh, and, I, and I felt for the parents because the parents, uh, they were losing control. And I said, I can't be culpable anymore. I cannot support what California is doing. So now I teach at a charter school near Roseville, California. That's where we live. Uh, I would love to always go back to public schools. I, I think that they're important, but I probably not in California. And uh, I will say this too, uh, today being the 28th of September and it is 325 p.m., it's rough, you know, when you get ostracized, when you are not going to be part of the collective anymore, uh, you're not part of them, you're just, it's rough. But with that being said, I have some new friends, life's looking good, God is good, Jesus Christ, my Lord, Savior, he's good. So let's just get down to it, that's my two minute and 30 second introduction, episode 32, October the 12th is when I posted this, um, this is when students become terrorists. The weather underground railed against the establishment. Today's campus protesters are supported by it. Call them the weather overground. Huh. Okay. And this is by Eli Lake, and he uh, posted this or published it on the 7th of September. Last year, American universities exploded with protests over a war uh, half a world away in Gaza. And by the way, when I when I post this, again, I said it's October the 12th. I don't know. Today is September the 28th. We'll see what happens. In solidarity with the perpetrators of October 7th, Kefiah-clad Kefiah -clad students covered campus grounds with encampments, took over buildings, waved the flags of terrorists, and menaced Jewish classmates. As fall semesters begin this week, some major universities from New York University to UCLA have implemented new rules to protect Jewish students from the protesters who declared sections of campus no-go zones, you creeps, uh, for Zionists, which often just means Jews. Nonetheless, the chaos appears to be returning. A week ago, at Temple University, Protesters marched in solidarity with Palestinian, quote-unquote, resistance against their colonizers. Oh, goodness. As students returned to class at the University of Pittsburgh, a man attacked a group of Jewish students with a bottle. Sick. Meanwhile, at the University of Michigan, four protesters were arrested during a die, D-I-E, a die-in. Oh. The longer the war in Gaza, the longer the unrest in the Middle East continues. The greater the fertile ground or fertile ground for an escalation or expansion of protests. Bruce Hoffman, a scholar at the Council on Foreign Relations and expert on domestic terrorism, told the Free Press, and this is where the article's from, and the Free Press is really good, by the way. 
Hoffman believes serious violence is not all out of question. If campus encampments are dismantled and protesters becoming convinced they are the victims of an oppressive state bent on usurping their rights. <sighs> History teaches that a few true believers can do plenty of damage once they decide that boycotts and sit-ins are not making a difference. It is, therefore, worth considering a worst-case scenario in which a vanguard decides demonstrations are not enough. That's what happened in the late 1960s when a small band of radicals moved from protest to violent resistance. They were known as the Weathermen. And like today's student protesters, they emerged from the Ivy League and other elite universities. I encourage you to read the rest of that article. Of course, it's in the description, the link there. And um, it's sick. I don't understand. How is this American to, America to you? What are you doing? That is crazy to me. That you're attacking Jewish people because they're Jewish and you think that's American? Oh, we have progressed so much, Paul. Have we? That feels like regression, not progression. It's nuts. Be kind to one another. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Maybe you didn't you missed that part of history. Leave the Jewish people alone. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Figure it out before it's too late. Okay. We're almost done with this book. Crimes of the Educators. Highly recommend to you. I'm outlining chapters. I don't want to read word for word because that'll bore you and I might get in trouble. This is chapter 27. Common Core Consumer Extortion on Steroids. Bill Gates says, It would be great if our education stuff worked, but we won't know for probably a decade. That's his quote. Governor Jeb Bush, president of the Foundation for Excellence in Education, and speaking at the 2013 meeting of the American Legislative Exchange Council in Chicago, drew attention to the skyrocketing costs of public education and the lousy product it delivers. Jeb Bush said, look at Detroit as the city descended into bankruptcy. Its public school system was mired in corruption and mismanagement, prompting Education Secretary Arne Duncan to call it a national disgrace. The city spends more than $19,000 a year per pupil, and for that investment, it produces some of the worst academic outcomers, outcomes in the nation. Go find uh, the article. Um, God, Will, what's his name? Conservative Will. Oh, I can't remember. See how much Chicago spends on their pupils, their children. Um, I think it's something like $23,000 per kid. And I think 11% of some race, I don't remember, uh, can read at age level, grade level, 11%. And we're spending $23,000. This is in Chicago. God, what is his name? Will? Conservative? Oh, okay. A couple more things. Um, the solution to our literacy problem is ridiculously simple. Just teach every child to read by intensive systematic, systemic, no, systematic phonics in kindergarten and first grade, and you will have a birth of uh, high literacy in America, reminiscent of the high literacy we had in the early days of the Republic with Noah Webster's, quote, blue-backed speller. You would have a much larger pool of literate... George Will, that's the guy's name, George Will, huh? George Will. Go, George Will. Chicago schools. Check it out. Okay. Whew, my goodness. You would have a much larger pool of literate Americans to fill all the high-tech jobs now available. Um, just a couple more things from this chapter. Like I said, I don't want to read the entire thing. It is not all that difficult to figure out what to teach in a school. What requires real ingenuity is figuring out a way of extorting billions of dollars from a long-suffering public that is becoming more and more disenchanted with public schools, but is still susceptible to educators' deception. Ooh, that's rough. Final paragraph. 
none of what is written in this chapter is going to bother the Common Core advocates. As long as Bill Gates is willing to pick up the tab, why worry? Things will change and everyone will adjust. After all, 45 million children will need to be educated regardless of whether the educators know how to do it or not. Next week's chapter, Common Core Standards and Educational Fraud. Thank you so much. Appreciate you uh, listening to this. I hope that you would pass it on to other teachers. Again, these are stories that are not being taught on colleges, uh, education campuses, nor is it going to be in the faculty lounges of schools because teachers are scared. Begin with the end of mind. Every choice you make is who you are. Choose wisely. Seek first to understand and be understood. And people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I care about you a lot. We do have a Venmo account. We'd love to have your financial support. We're a retired mom and pop attempting to help you. Love you. God bless.